Weet je? Gofé. 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 Oké. So we're going we're gonna to get started. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for coming to the uh, ESC PhD uh, colloquium. Uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, Wen, uh, Wencheng Chen, who uh, did his undergraduate uh, degree in applied physics from University of uh, Science and Technology in uh, Hefei, China, uh, before coming to uh, University of Pennsylvania in uh, 2011. Um, and he's, he's been a PhD student in electrical and systems engineering. So today he's going to uh, present some of his uh, recent work on uh, optics and uh, nanoparticles. So, uh, yeah. Without further ado. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, so I'm now a fifth year PhD student in Sherry Kagan's group. We work on uh, plasma and devices. So I want to first introduce uh, a basic two definitions about plasmonics to you. The first one is plasmonics is a study of interaction between light and the free electrons inside the metal. And the second one is plasmons are collective oscillations of the free electron gas density. So uh, these two definitions may be very abstractive. So you may not uh, be able to understand it very well without an example. So I take a very basic example in plasmonics, which is a metal sphere, metal sphere inside a medium. Uh, the dielectrics of the medium is epsilon m. The dielectrics for this metal sphere is epsilon omega, which means its dielectrics is inhomogeneous it will change according to the different frequency of the light that's incident on the metal sphere. So uh, suppose there is light shining on this metal sphere. The light is electromagnetic field. So there, is, there will be an electrical field that's uh, imposed on this metal sphere. So that will polarize the free electrons inside this sphere. So positive charges will be pulled to one side, and the negative charges will be pulled to the other side. This will form an electrical dipole inside, the, um, inside this sphere. If we solve Maxwell's equations, we can see what's the magnitude for this electrical dipole inside this metal sphere. So the each the interesting thing about this equation is that it has a denominator, which means if this denominator becomes a minimum, then this dipole moment becomes a maximum. So that's called a resonance inside this metal sphere. And the condition for this denominator becomes a minimum is that when the incident light frequency equals omega p over square root of 3. So at this incident frequency, there will be a lot of charges accumulate on both sides of this metal sphere. And uh, it will cause a called localized surface plasma resonance. So these accumulated charges will usually generate very strong electrical field around this structure. From this figure, so this is a simulation for the electrical field around these nano antennas. The brightness means how strong the electrical field is. We can see around the edges, the electrical field becomes very strong when the light uh, incidence onto this sample. People are very interested in this behavior because it can be used in uh, enhancing a lot of signals that usually we cannot see uh, by current technology. So suppose we use it to detect uh, silk fibroin, which is a protein. For this protein, it has two signature vibrational modes uh, that are emit one and emit two. So normally, by normal transmission spectroscopy or reflectance spectroscopy, we cannot really tell these two 
signature vibrational modes. But if we put this protein close to these uh, antenna structures, the strong electrical field created by the nano antennas can enhance these two vibrational modes. So now from this spectrum, after the detection of this two spectrum, we can tell there are two peaks here in this reflectance spectrum. So these two peaks are actually cor corresponding these two vibrational modes. So now from spectrum, we can tell easily that oh, there is a protein here be, uh, very close to the antennas. So that's why people in biology or in health system, they like this idea because they can use it to build up uh, sensors for detecting different kinds of proteins. They even come up with a hypothetical biosensor uh, with this plasma learning structure. So this hypothetical biosensor has two parts. The first part is a biochip. The second part is a reader. So uh, suppose we want to detect a kind of bacteria in the blood. What we can do is we drop the blood into a biochip, and the blood will, come, will first go through a sample treatment process and then flow onto the plasma structures. And then we insert a biochip into this reader, which will take a spectrum of these plasma structures. And now the computer will analyze the data and give us the information about what kind of protein it is. So this technique compared to traditional, uh, traditional process for detecting a protein, the advantage is it's small and cheap and uh, faster. So it doesn't require like very well-trained people to conduct the process. Uh, people with little experience can use this setup. So uh, besides the biosensor application, plasma structures enjoy a lot of other applications too. So here shows the uh, ultrasyn lenses that people can make based on plasma, very, very small plasma structures. So they arrange these plasma structures circularly. And uh, uh, because these structures have amazing ability to interact with light, so the lights become focused after it passing through this matter surface. Here shows a uh, ultrasound quarter wave plate. It can change circularly polarized lights into linear, linear polarization, or the inverse way. It shows an example of a uh, bending light from the interface. The interface can be designed to bend the incident light into any direction you want after it passing through the interface. So uh, now we see there are different functionalities for plasma structures. Uh, it also has several challenges for bringing these plasma uh, ideas into practical use. The, uh, there, is, there is a fabrication challenge, which is to fabricate these very, very small structures over a large area for practical use usually takes very long time and uh, usually costs a lot of money. So the traditional way to fabricate these nanoscale structures is based on E-beam lithography, which is uh, using a substrate and spin called E-beam resist, and then use electron beam to exposure the resist. You can draw whatever pattern you want uh, by the electron beam. Like here, they draw a U-shaped structure one point by one point using electron beam. And then you do developing and deposit metal. After lift off, only the metal are left behind on the substrates. So in such way, you can create substrate, uh, you can create structures as small as 10 nanometers. But the disadvantage is this process is slow and expensive. So what 
we are trying to do is we are exploring new lithography methods that are suitable for fabricating these structures over a large area and in a fast and cheaper way. So what we are trying to do is we use nano imprinting combined of gold colloidal nanocrystals. The nano imprinting technology is, is that you first fabricate a template of the pattern that you want to use uh, in your final substrates. And then you imprint the template into the resist and uh, create a reverse structure of the final structure you want. Then you, you can spin code the colloidal gold nanocrystals onto the resist. So these nanocrystals will fill inside the pattern area. Then after lift off, ending the pattern area and the, uh, ending the nanocrystals inside the pattern area will be left behind. So in such way, you can create these uh, structures by, uh, in, in a large area by using a template. So to demonstrate our, uh, this, this, uh, this method, we fabricate nano antenna samples as, a, uh, as an example. By using different concentrations of gold nanocrystal solutions, we can fabricate nano antennas of different heights. So these three are AFM images, and their height information is plotted out here. As you can see, the height varies from 77 nanometers to 109 nanometers. And uh, in, uh, in this figure, it shows the transmission spectrum of these two uh, samples. As the height of these, two uh, of these three samples increases, the resonance intensity for, the, for these samples also increases, which makes sense, because the height will uh, scattering more light from the incident light. So we also show that we can, we can fabricate nano antennas of different lenses uh, by using our method. So these four samples, their lenses varies from 163 nanometers. I apologize, these numbers are very small. It varies from 163 nanometers to 817 nanometers. And uh, their resonance signal are plotted here as a solid line. It varies from near IR, which is 1,000 nanometers, to mid IR, which is 3,000 nanometers. And we also fabricate the uh, bulk gold nano antennas by traditional e-beam lithography, and their resonances are plotted out as a dashed line here. So we can have a comparison of our performance with a traditional method. And we can see they are very close. So uh, after demonstrating that we can fabricate nanostructures and uh, control their dimensions, we continue to fabricate a real uh, plasmonic device, which is a quarter wave plate. The design of this quarter wave plate is showing here, and the dimensions of the structures are showing here. So this quarter wave, uh, this figure shows the transmittance and the phase information for this quarter wave plate, and it will work. The working wavelength range for it is from 2,700 to 3,000 nanometers. Then we experimentally fabricate uh, this sample and set up the optics to take the measurements. So we send in circularly polarized light onto the sample and measure uh, the output. The output is plotted here and we can see it is quite linearly polarized. So in this way, we can prove that our, uh, our fabricated sample is really working as a quarter wave plate. And this work is, public, is published early this, earlier this year in nanometers. So uh, after this, I continue to work on my other project 
one of them I find very interesting, which is using the plasmonic micro antennas as a sensor to detect the water. We know in agriculture, the water is a very precious resource. And uh, we want to know when the soil is dry and when it's wet, so we can use water efficiently in agriculture. And uh, there is a very interesting material that absorbs water uh, very, very hugely, I will say. This is hydrogel. You can see in this figure, it shows a dry hydrogel. And in this figure, it shows a hydrogel that's swollen in water. The volume of hydrogel can change a thousand times after it, after it goes soaked in water. So this is a material that usually people use in diapers for baby. And it's intoxic. So we choose it as a, math, uh, as a basic material for our structure uh, used in water sensor. The theory for this water sensor is that we first fabricate uh, nano antennas on glass substrates, and then we coat hydrogel onto, the, uh, onto our fabricated nano antennas. So this SEM image shows the fabricated nano antennas. So this image shows the transmittance of the sample before and after coating hydrogel. The black curve shows the transmit tense spectrum before coating, and the red curve shows uh, after coating. You can see the resonance changes for about uh, 200, more than 200 nanometers when, when the hydrogel is coated onto a sample. That is because the nano antenna's resonance is very sensitive to its environment. When the dielectrics of the environment changes, then the resonance changes. Here, for the air, the dielectrics is one, but for hydrogel, it's larger than one. So what we did next is we soak the hydrogel in water. So after hydrogel uh, soaked in water, it absorbs water. So now its dielectrics changes again, because now it's basically a mixture of hydrogel and the water. From the optical spectrum, we can see the resonance of the nano antennas actually changes to shorter wavelengths after the hydrogel soaks in water. Then we take hydrogel out and uh, let just keep it in the uh, in the air, and uh, it will dry gradually. So we observe this uh, procedure by taking the transmittance spectrum over time. We can see as the hydrogel gradually becomes dry, the resonance of the nano antennas gradually shift to longer wavelengths. So for different percentage of the hydrogel that for different percentage of water hydrogel absorbs, the nano antennas actually gives us different optical uh, resonance. In such a way you can tell like how wet or how dry the environment is. So if we use a thicker hydrogel layer, oh, sorry, this process is very fast. Actually, as you can see, after eight minutes, the hydrogel become completely dry in the air. If we use a thicker hydrogel layer, we can turn the drying process to a longer time, so now hydrogel responds more slower than before, so it's in a more controllable way. In this, uh, this thickness is about 600 microns, and it takes about one day for the hydrogel to completely become dry. So this is a dream picture for, the, for plasmonic sensors to be used in, uh, in agriculture. Uh, we can put the our sensors in the field. So when the, when the drone, when it flies through the field, it can take the reflectance optical response of the sensors, and then it can map out well, um, like which part of the field is dry and which part has enough water 
So we don't, we can specifically just water the dry area to use water more efficiently. Yes. So the traditional uh, sensor for humidity, they really need a battery to constantly like supply the power to the sensor to make it work. But for our hydrogel sensor, we don't need any battery. We don't need any power. It's just when the detector goes through it and sends the signal to the sample and gets a signal back, then you can tell how dry or how wet our sensor is. So this is my talk for today. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, very nice talk. Um, I, I do have a question regarding to the, the fabrication part. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but with my limited knowledge, I, I know that uh, not only Ukraine has probably a, a problem being being uh, being scaled up to uh, you know uh, mass production to fulfill the dream of the agriculture sector, and also it might have. Yeah, that's very good comments. So, uh, nano imprinting is a nosography that based on e-beam nosography. Actually, we use e-beam nosography to create templates for nano imprinting. The good thing about it is that the template can be used multiple times, and in a very fast way to create patterns. So, uh, you talk about the uh, size variation over the pattern uh, after nano-imprinting isography. Actually, we demonstrated in this paper that the size variation for these patterns is a little bit larger than EBL, but it's within a tolerance that we can accept. And uh, the variation still makes this sample works fine as a quarter wave plate, as you can tell from these spectrums. So from this angle, uh, we demonstrate that the variation is within the tolerance except uh, with our acceptance range. Uh, you also said uh, the production ability for nano-imprinting in large area fabrication. Actually, nano-imprinting is famous for its ability to be applied to a large area. Because if you have enough money, then you can make a template that as big as you want. And then you can imprint it on the substrate as many times as you want to create large area patterns. And it supports, actually, in the industry, they call it row-to-row -row production. So they have a row here and row here. The substrate is just going like uh, when the row rotates, then the substrate going this way, and then the nano imprinting process just imprint, and then it, ro it rolls away, and then imprint again. So it also supports the row to row fabrication process in industry. Yes. Yeah. We yeah we use discount process, and uh, more importantly, we need to match the template height. So the pattern there is pattern on the template, and the pattern height need to match the resist height, so that you can reach down to the bottom. So that makes sure there is a very very thin layer 
resist left, and it can be cleaned away by discount process. Yes. Yeah, because the resonance it generates. So the resonance is actually the electrons that oscillate inside the antennas. So antennas are usually much smaller than the wavelengths you are using. Like for your cell phone, it operates uh, in like microns wavelengths, but the, the antennas in your cell phone is just probably my, uh, just several microns. So the antennas are usually much smaller than the wavelengths it operates at. So here is actually the same thing. This small narrow rows operates actually uh, its resonance I show here. Its resonance is around 3 microns, although the lengths of these structures are within 1 micron. Yes. I'm sorry, go. Oh, how I set up this optical measurement? Go previously? This one? Oh, this is a conceptual picture I got from uh, from internet. It's actually a drone company that create this to sell their drone for the agriculture. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. This is using gold to build it. Uh, I haven't tried silver because silver is very easily oxidized in the air and it's kind of difficult to control. So gold is a very stable material that people usually use in plasmatic devices. Is there any other commonly used material in the plasmatic devices? Uh, like other mobile Yes. So people also use aluminum in some cases, but aluminum, its wavelength is very limited probably in the visible or even in UV wavelength range. People use gold and silver for most cases and are also exploring other materials like highly doped semiconductors to work as uh, plasma earning materials. Oh, nano crystal? Yeah. How, how, you know, is there any, any um, uh, performance improvement? Because, you know, surely you would be using the best amount of nano crystal gold. So, nano crystal gold, uh, we are still exploring its advantage compared to traditional bulk gold. So, what we can say right now is that. The fabrication process is completely chemical synthesis, so it's a solution process. We synthesis nanocrystal from solutions, and for fabrication, we just spin coat onto a sample. We don't need high vacuum evaporation for like usually required for bulk gold. So that's uh, like uh, we usually in industry people usually like solution process because it's faster and also easier to conduct. Uh, so that's an advantage for using nanocrystals. For the performance of nanocrystals compared to gold, right now we can what we can say is the resonance of the nano antennas made from nanocrystal gold is actually a little bit uh, smaller in its amplitude compared to bulk gold. So if you want a very sharp resonance, you probably still want to choose bulk gold. You don't want to choose nanocrystals. 
But if you consider a price, then you may want to choose nanocrystals because it's cheaper. And uh, we are also exploring other properties of nanocrystals, but it's still in experiment. So I cannot say for sure right now to say what's the advantage, what other advantages nanocrystals have.